Hello, my name is Rupinder Syal and welcome to Spartan Tutorials. So regulation of gene expression and the idea that some proteins can actually bind DNA to regulate gene expression is pretty new considering the history of molecular biology. In the 1980s, many studies, especially led by Bob Tijian and many of the other scientists, led to the identification of many proteins called transcription factors. In fact, one of the first transcription factors was purified and isolated by Bob Tijian's group at University of California, Berkeley, and it was named Specificity Protein 1 or SP1. And since then, we have had a catalog of various other proteins involved in different biological processes in, involved in, for example, embryonic development and their misregulation can lead to disease. So all sorts of proteins can bind DNA. RNA polymerase is a good example of a protein which can bind DNA. And they have multiple types of DNA binding domains and motifs which can help them to bind DNA. And it is a rapidly expanding area of biological research nowadays. So one of the techniques to characterize whether a particular protein binds to a DNA fragment is gel shift assay or electrophoretic mobility shift assay. And that's what we are going to discuss today. So there is a huge diversity of DNA binding proteins and their domains. For example, we have here helix turn helix domains found in crow repressor, important in bacteriophage lambda biology, zinc finger domains, for example, this is found in glucocorticoid receptor, yeast regulatory protein GAL4, I'm sure many of you must have heard of this. It is involved in galactose metabolism, one of the earliest transcription factors studied and leucine zippers. They have this cool looking leucine zipper, uh, you know, motif, which allows them to bind to DNA. And one of the important canonical examples of transcription factors is GCN4. It is found in yeast and it is a leucine zipper. You can see how they bind to the DNA in a slightly different fashion for, per, for different domains. So characterizing this takes a lot of time, takes a lot of research, but one of the first clues that a protein can be bound to DNA comes from studies like EMSA or electrophoretic mobility shift assay. Although the name sounds you know very long but the concept is pretty simple. So this is the idea. The idea is that you have a purified DNA fragment and what you do is in the earlier days at least you radio labeled it. It was end labeled at the 5 prime using p32 so using alpha p32 you can radio label it this can be done by for example polynucleotide kinase and then you had your transcription factor or protein of interest okay. and you mix them up allow them to equilibrate and then you run a native page gel this is an important distinction here you run a native page gel you don't want a denatured protein binding to the dna those are not biologically plausible results anyway. So you want native page gel. You have a polycrylamide gel, right? Because those are used for separation of proteins. And the unbound probe, which is highly radioactive, it will basically settle at the bottom because it has the highest mobility. It is the shortest size. Usually the size of this probe, this DNA fragment is somewhere between 50 and 200 base pairs so it runs to the bottom of the gel okay and the idea is in the samples where you don't put any protein you have your control samples those are your control wells there will just be this low-lying unbound probe but where you add the transcription factor and if your transcription factor binds to that DNA it will cause a shift because it will form a higher molecular weight complex okay and that leads to the shift assay so electrophoretic mobility shift right mobility shift means movement shift how it shifts the mobility during electrophoresis and that's the assay okay and it can be further enhanced if you have specific antibodies for your protein 
So what will happen is you will get even more higher weight molecular complex uh, formed and that is called a super shift. Okay, so this is a super shift. Okay, so we have free probe. This is shift and this is super shift. That is the overall idea. Very simple to execute. Although it was, it is very laborious and, and it posed a lot of risk for the experimenter in the earlier days because there is a lot of radioactivity involved here, but still a very useful assay. Here is a schematic of how you will have the samples. So in the first well, you have just the probe. Everything else is missing. Then you add your protein of interest plus your probe. So it will give this higher molecular weight complex. So you will have your shift. You also add competitor here, specific competitor, okay? And hopefully that will also lead to binding and formation of this complex. But this specific competitor usually is, this is a DNA, but this is called cold. Cold means it is not radio labeled. So what will happen is, there will be formation of complex, but you will not be able to see it on the gel. So when you develop the X-ray film, there is nothing here. So that tells you that actually it was the specific DNA that was causing this shift. Because when you put a cold competitor, it eliminated that signal. So in the fourth lane, we have probe plus mutant or non-competitor and the protein so again this should return your shift so that's what we see here because now we have a mutant or non-competitor some other dna band which does not compete with your dna uh, fragment of interest so it should return the shift okay and finally we have addition of antibody antibody probe and protein so this will lead to a super shifted complex which is shown here which has the lowest mobility here is an example of a 16 residue, very small, single-stranded DNA. So I told you that usually the range of DNA fragments is pretty uh, much between 50 and 200 base pairs. So here we are using a smaller fragment and we are using it to probe the binding to human angiotensin precursor protein. And we are using more and more amounts of protein here. In the A, A well, there is no protein here, but B to L, there is increasing amount of protein. So you can see 0.57, almost double the amount of protein in each well. Okay, These are micromolar amounts, but these are sufficient to produce this shift. Again, this is an example from, I think uh, many of you must be familiar with, this is the binding of cap protein, catabolite activator protein, as well as the lag repressor to the operator and promoter DNA. So here we have free DNA. So just the DNA without any protein. And here you have the cap protein. So there are these multimers being formed as you increase the amount of cap protein. And when you add repressor, because the repressor also binds to this, you can see the formation of uh, different multimers of cap protein as well as the repressor being formed and it leads to even higher shifts. So you can see it is pretty qualitative, kind of semi-quantitative, but I think using proper controls, you can kind of quantitate it. And there have been a number of studies where people have tried to quantitate the stoichiometry as well as the binding affinity of different proteins. But I think overall, if you uh, really want to rely on it for quantitative purposes, I would advise against it. Uh, it can be done for specialized purposes, but most of the time, researchers use it for qualitative purposes. They just want to know in a binary fashion whether a protein binds to the DNA or not. So here is the setup again, just to reiterate my point, where we have free nucleotide probe increasing protein quantity. It leads to the shift here and leads to formation of nucleotide protein complex as you increase the amount of protein. If you use a specific competitor, it leads to 
abolition of this band okay so pretty much this is the overall setup for gel shift assay there are a couple of advantages to this technique it is a highly sensitive assay as you saw with micromolar amounts of protein and very little amount of dna fragments you can pretty much do this assay very easily and nowadays there are a lot of variants so you don't have to use the auto radiography uh, for this technique you can use fluorescence chemiluminescence immunohistochemistry all sorts of things okay so radioactivity is not the only choice that we have and it is compatible with, with various sized dna as well as protein molecules various dna rna structures for example we can do it with single stranded dna double stranded dna single stranded rna g quadruplexes triplex dna so all sorts of dna fragments and dna structures we can use it for okay so it is very versatile technique and of course as with any technique it has this disadvantages too samples are not at chemical equilibrium during electrophoresis so now this is a uh, little bit uh, complicated to understand here but let me try so what will happen is you are mixing the proteins and dna fragments and then you are electrophoresizing them now during that time there is a big chance that the proteins will come off from the dna these are not you know these are not very sticky interactions these are usually non covalent interactions so there is a very big chance that you may lose the interaction during the time of electrophoresis if it is not very strong okay so a negative signal right so as they say absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence that it, it applies here just because you did not notice a gel shift in your particular protein of interest does not mean that your protein does not bind maybe the binding is very weak and you may need to check it with other methods whether it is really a negative signal and no information about the actual sequence bound by the protein we don't know right the, we just know okay this fragment binds dna but where is the actual sequence so we have to use other methods for example dna is one footprinting and i'll be making a video about that very soon so we will use that to actually find the dna sequence bound by the protein of interest so it's a pretty yes no kind of technique so that was my discussion of gel shift assay or electrophoretic mobility shift assay i hope you found the information useful do subscribe to my channel and give it a thumbs up uh, if you like the video and if you found the information helpful till the next time we meet take care and bye bye